uh, welcome everybody. Um, I will uh, see, go ahead and uh, call the meeting to order. And let's see, I have uh, just a, well, <laughs> um, let's see. I, I have a few comments. I was gonna make them at the beginning, but I think I'll, I'll wait um, and go ahead and let uh, John go on. Um, let John welcome everybody. And then maybe when, uh, when we get down uh, into one of the later agenda items, um, maybe um, visit or I'll, I'll make comments later. Um, Cause hey, I- Sam. Yeah, so, uh, the comments I was wanted to share with uh, the committee members, but I'm hoping a few more committee members will show up before I give those comments. So. Sounds good. And um, we have uh, Benita H. and uh, Ms. Velasquez has joined us. Okay. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I just want to thank you all for, for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is John Tornatori, and I'm the, the Director of Continuous Improvement in LCAP here in San Juan. Um, tonight, we're going to have a, a real fun agenda this evening that includes some community building uh, activities. Uh, we're going to have some presentations from our Parent Leadership Academy, as well as our San Juan Youth Voice uh, advocates, advocates Group. Uh, we'll have some time to engage in a gallery walk to collect some additional input that will help inform our 2021-24 um, LCAP. Um, and then also, we're going to provide you with some time to make some personal connections um, to our work um, to our PAC work. Uh, our intention this evening is really to create a space for both, for, for us to both connect and learn with one another. So um, we're just gonna kick it off here and we're gonna begin with um, a, a short community building activity. So I'm gonna ask Laura here to uh, share the screen here and we're gonna show our norms here. Laura, are you there? I am. Oh. Do you see the norms? You know what? I... Not yet. Not yet. Oh. Well, that's strange. Let me, okay. There we go. See them? There we go. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what we'd like you to do is we have the norms set up there. These are our shared values and shared norms that uh, we introduced uh, the last month when we met. And so what we would like everyone to do is to pick a word, pick a sentence or a phrase from, uh, from the values and norms that resonates with you. Uh, we're gonna ask, we're gonna give you a few minutes just to, to read this document and just kind of go through it and see which word, phrase or, or sentence really resonates with you. And then we'll put you in a breakout room give you an opportunity to share your thinking with one another, and then we'll return and uh, share out with the, with the whole group. So um, this document will be shared in your breakout room, so you don't need to memorize this by any, by any means. But before we go into breakout rooms, I'm just gonna give a minute of silence here and just let you all uh, read that. And then uh, Laura, we can, um, you can send us off into mm -hmm. our breakout rooms. Yeah, and actually we've just got six pack members here. Um, so what, Stephanie, is Elnora with you by any chance? Can you come off mute and let us know? Okay, maybe in the chat box. I'll put something in the chat. Okay, so Laura, everybody. if you could, put, um, we can go out in our breakout room. So once again, everybody, you're going to re read this, uh, our values and norms, pick a word, a sentence or a phrase that resonates with you and just take turns sharing with one another in your small breakout rooms. And then we will see each other uh, back again in about five minutes or so. All right, welcome back, everybody. I think we have everyone back here. 
Excellent. All right, does anyone, um, what, does anyone like to share the a word, the sentence or phrase that resonated with them, with the, with the larger group? Um, I don't want to butcher the line because I don't have it in front of me. But, oh, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, well, it, it may, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Be flexible and function with urgency, not perfection. And, and I mentioned that, you know, growing up, we heard practice makes perfect. And, and I've learned that practice makes progress over my, that's like, I've kind of used that line and that kind of just hit with me there. Great. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Would anyone else like to share? Uh, I'm happy to jump in. Um, sure. I met with Ms. Karen um, okay. and we had a, a great time uh, chatting. Um, one of the things that we talked about uh, as it pertained to this exercise was access. Um, being super important. Uh, we were kind of sharing our experiences as parents um, within the district and, um, you know, uh, yeah, just the importance of one knowing about the LCAP and finding um, uh, important ways for, for us as either parents or as students to get engaged in decision making um, and to kind of know how to, you know, speak truth to power and to impact the system. Um, from our vantage point and knowing where those opportunities were was something that we talked about. Thank you, Heather. Did anyone maybe want to share anything that they learned or, or heard or noticed in your group conversation? Yeah, like uh, Tom mentioned that, you know, building trust is fundamental to making all of those things happen and uh, everything happen. You have to have trust and confidence in, in what what you're doing so i appreciated tom's comments on trust being uh crucial tom i see your mouth moving but we can't hear you so i'm not sure if you're if you know you're sorry, on the sorry yeah thank you yeah <laughs> uh since steve shared what what uh, you know what I voiced. I, I, I guess I'll share what I heard from Kenan, which I thought was extremely valuable, and, and always love to hear from you know the the students' perspective, especially um, you know that's what we're here for, is that uh, the the um, the ability to uh, lift the voice and and be heard. So I think that's real important to to hear what our students have to say. Um, so I, I thought I would share that, that since Ken was also in our group. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Well, as we transition, as we wrap this part up, I just wanted to, to mention that we'll continue to revisit these norms and these values throughout our, our meetings together, because it's really important. It's one thing to just have them up as words on a wall. But for them to mean something, it's important that we try to continue to revisit them, make connections to them, live them out in our own personal way when we come into our meetings, but then also to look for and recognize and appreciate others when folks are living these norms and values out in, in our work. So today, um, before we kind of send off into our, our next section here, I'm just going to ask that everyone take a moment and just uh, pick one of those norms or values that you would like to try to live out in today's meeting. Um, but then also make a commitment to try to seek out and, and, and I see where some of these values and norms are being lived out by other folks in our, in our meeting here. Steve, who's that? Sorry, I had to, we had to wave. Hey, Luke, come here. It's Luke. He wanted to say hi to everybody. He's like, what's dad doing? My, my almost nine-year-old's too shy, so. Hey, Luke. <laughs> All right, I think that's a perfect way to end this section here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna transition into the uh, the next section here, which is our board liaison um, update and our superintendent update. So we'll start with uh, our board liaison, um, uh, Paula Viasquez. Hi, good evening. Can um, I'm having some technical issues on my end. Can you hear me though? We can, Paula. Yeah, thank right, you. Right, I just wanted to confirm. Um, 
glad to be with you here um, this evening. You know, I, to be honest, I'm not sure I can offer <laughs> a succinct update that's not about getting back to class in some way. Um, that is the topic, um, the topic of the day of the week until we get there. Uh, it'll continue to be the topic. And so um, I can, I think, maybe offer just the briefest of updates, which is for particularly for those who may not join our, our board meetings. We just continue to, to watch our county and state thresholds to see what comes next. Um, we've, we've got a plan regardless, but it looks like we might be out of the purple tier soon, which is exciting and would then kind of commence the series of events that leads us back to a hybrid um, in-person instructional model. Um, that is a pretty focused line of effort for, for everyone. I think outside of that, we continue um, to, uh, you know, I'm first, I'm glad to be here. A lot of the key work that needs to happen will continue here for sure. But I think once we get past that, um, you know, not hurdle, but into a different environment, um, you know, we'll be able to kind of look to things like commencement and some other things and summer learning and, and those kind of things. So that's pretty much the extent of my update. I apologize if it was a little bit rambly, but I'll see if Kent has anything he wants to add. All right, President Vasquez, thank you so much. Um, Superintendent Kern, uh, would you like to say a few words? Oh, you're on mute, sir. Thanks, John. Um, I, thanks, Paula. And um, I, I appreciate that update. We're, we're getting excited for students to come back. Uh, we, it looks like we will hopefully hit red on the 16th. We have a new agreement that five days after that we would return. So we would be returning students on the 22nd. Been a lot of conversation about the, the different models. I would encourage folks, rather than me taking up a lot of time tonight to, to go to YouTube and watch the board meeting from the last time. Um, I gave a pretty detailed explanation as why we chose the model that we did. Um, and so we're just, we're just excited about getting students back. I did wanna share with the, the members here who didn't know we did two vaccination clinics three weeks ago and two weeks ago, and we vaccinated almost 5,000 community members and staff over those two weekends. I think it was 2,300 plus the first weekend, 2,500 plus the second. Uh, the second of the, the folks that had their vaccinations the first three weeks ago are getting their second this weekend on Sunday. And then next Saturday will be the second. I did share at the board meeting as well with us starting on the 22nd, there is some concern that we will have some challenges right away um, that there's an adverse reaction to that second um, dose. And we could, we could see and, and <laughs> that we may have some staff. So we're already putting plans into place to be as best prepared as we can, but until we know how many um, won't be there. And I do see a question about, do we know how many staff have been vaccinated? We have a ballpark, but that is something that we, we wouldn't ask because it potentially kind of violates people's rights. We do know that we had about 14% of our teachers unit say they were not going to be vaccinated. So that's a very, very high percentage. When you think about you hear 70, 30, we may be around 86%. Um, we, we know how many staff we vaccinated at our two clinics, but you had many, many folks getting vaccinated at other places that we're offering it. Um, so again, we don't know the exact percentages of it, but we think it's it's pretty high. So we're excited about the return um, and just uh, you know looking forward to kids being back in school. And John, I'll leave it with that. All right, thank you, Superintendent Kern, appreciate it. Um, so what we're gonna do now is we'll transition here to our, our staff report. Um, and we have one staff report this evening. Um, I'm happy to introduce uh, Benita H., who uh, works in our FACE department and will be speaking this evening about our Parent and Leadership Academy. So, uh, Benita, I'll turn it over to you if, you, if, you're, if you're ready to go. Yes, I am ready to go. Thank you. And thank you um, for inviting me to share our exciting news about Family Leadership Academy. And you'll hear me go back and forth and say Parent Leadership Academy 
Family Leadership Academy, because we're sort of rebranding. So seven years ago when we started, we called it Parent Leadership Academy. But okay. as we've grown, so have we realized our, our definition of parents, because sometimes they're guardians where they're grandparent, foster parent, a, a, a caring neighbor in the community. So we're seeing family leadership in a whole different um Point of view. So I'm going to show a video. It's about two and a half minutes. I know that some of our leadership people are on here who are, who are attending the meeting. So they'll see it before tomorrow. So just act surprised when you see it Friday. And then I will share some highlights from this one. So Laura, if you can start, please. <laughs> Family Leadership Academy is a um, six-week academy where parents or caregivers can come and learn more about district programs and initiatives. Seven years ago, I was so happy if I can get 14 people to sign up. Now we have over 62 families. This year is special because we have been able to do this academy in three languages, English, Spanish, and Farsi and Pashto, and that is what uh, the district is is a very diverse community. We all are together at once, and then we go into our separate breakout rooms so they can get the information in their language, preferred language, and then we come back at the end as another whole family together. So they feel very um, appreciative that we are providing information in their own language, and that we are providing that platform for them to express their own opinion. It's been really, really nice to kind of see that sense of community coming together within folks who may not uh, necessarily be able to communicate with each other due to language barriers, but that we all kind of have the same goals and, and the same uh, perspective and that our, our main focus is making sure that our kiddos are being supported. Being able to help families um, learn how to advocate for themselves and for their students is a big deal. And that's what this academy did, the Parent Leadership Academy. It helped parents teach them how to be involved um, in, their, in their students' education, in their students' schools. Um, to know what's going on, be a part of it. I have one parent that's meeting with the school principal at Pasadena, and sh she's sharing her ideas about a STEM program and, and bringing other community activities to the group. Uh, so I think now they um, understand that as a parent, they are a very, playing a very big role in a school district and their schools. The participants of this program will function in future as mentors for their community. Uh, I'm assured that now they have the skills on how to lead. They are ambassadors and they are going to share this information that they have with their family, with the community, in their schools, and that is the goal for this. Thank you, Laura. You bet. Thank you. So I just wanted to highlight that this um, this year we actually partnered with the newcomer support team, and that's why we were able to reach out to a lot of our families. Um, and I'm just so excited because I think these families that are participating here, they're the future of San Juan. And this is such an excellent time for families in our district right now because as we reinvent in education, families' voices will be part of that. And I know that you're gonna have the students on there. I think it's real important that we have the students' voice, the families' voices as we um, continue on this wonderful journey in education system right now. And I think they'll have another a lot of input. input. One of the things, highlights I wanted to share out of this particular group they, uh, a lot of the families were really interested in learning about the school system. So we went over the org chart, who's making decisions, how they're making decisions. And they were really excited about that. We had quite a few families that were, um, our EL families that were interested in the special ed process and learning about that process worked and how did it mean from their country compared to here. So it was a lot of dialogue about that. And what's really nice is that the families got to communicate with each other because when we have three different languages, our goal is for them to know that we're all the same residents, the same community, we're San Juan family. So that was one of the wonderful highlights that came out of it. And we are encouraging them to continue to be their voice, whether they're a voice in the district, whether they're a voice in the San Juan community, but their voice is important. So that's um, all I have to say, and I'm excited. And we have a graduation tomorrow. Um, we were having it yesterday, but the skies opened up and told us Friday's a better day. And so we'll be at San Juan having a drive-in graduation celebration tomorrow. We'll have a, a movie theater site. They'll sit in their cars, they'll drive up, they'll get their certificates, they'll get boxes of, of t-shirts and just a lot of 
thanks for them. And most of them have asked for us to continue with the part two. And so I'm not sure exactly where we're gonna go with that at this point. Does anybody have any questions? Wow, I don't have any questions, but thank you all for that amazing work. That's super exciting. And I love how you all are, are not letting COVID stop you from celebrating and the innovation of just even the drive through graduation. We appreciate you so much. I'm, Go on, I'm glad, yeah, I'm glad to be the part of there and now here and tomorrow. I'm really excited and I will inform to all the families whom I know about this and as community, thank you. Thank you for making so much proud. This is so amazing. Anyway, so I thank you, Neelam. I'm so excited. Like I said, we, we had a great turnout. And I think partly is that we realized too, as we've learned, our participation has increased um, because of Zoom. So sometimes Zooms, people are tired of Zooms, but for families, you don't have to cook. You're just at your house, you're chilling. And what's really nice is that their kids are running around and their students are seeing their parents involved in, in their school system. So they're not seeing them on their campus, but they're seeing them involved. So yes, it was definitely a great experience for all. Um, and I think that's it, unless anyone has any questions for me. Vinny, just one last thing. Forgive me if I, if, I, uh, if I miss this, but if someone was interested in getting involved or being a part of the Family Leadership Academy, who would they reach out to or, or who would they contact? Well, they would reach out to the FACE department and I'll put it in the chat. Um, how they can reach out to us. At this, we don't currently have another one planned until next spring. However, we did have a request from the parents because they're, they want to continue. So we might do um, a series of a part two on different things. Great. Yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate you joining us this evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to turn it over here to, to uh, Tom, who is going to help facilitate our general visitor comments. So Tom, the, the floor is yours here. OK, uh, thank you. Um, actually, I thought I would go ahead. Um, Laura, do, do, we don't have quorum yet, do we? Uh, we do not have quorum, Tom. OK. Um, um, let's see. I, um, well, I think. Uh, be, well, before visitor um, comments, I'll, I'll make a couple of uh, sort of welcoming <laughs> comments that okay. I was hoping to to do when people were uh, when we had uh, more of the, the committee here. But uh, I wanted to uh, uh, sort of address communications because uh, and say that uh, our remote meetings have, have changed the way we communicate uh, during our, our meetings. And at in-person meetings, uh, body language communicates a lot of information. I, I read just today, like uh, uh, the total impact of, of a message when you're in person is 55% is like facial expressions, hand gestures, postures, and other forms of, of language. And when I say even when people have their cameras on, a lot of the body language is, is not visible the way it would be in in-person. However, remote meetings provide another communication method and that other method has, um, it's another method that we haven't used for in-person meetings and that is the chat feature. And as Laura mentioned, when she um, sent out the email to the PAC members, chat is now enabled. So uh, in, instead of uh, uh, a lack of connection uh, due to sort of a lack of body language, I, you know, I suggest we kind of take a glass is, is half full attitude and use chat. So uh, as a way to augment some of the, the communication that's being missed uh, from body language. So if, if you have a comment to make or a question to ask, uh, you no for one, you no longer have to wait to have the floor. Uh, feel free, and I encourage uh, committee members to you know type your comments and, and questions at any time in, in chat. Um, so, wanted to pass that on because I know that was of some communications with uh, some concerns that was expressed at our previous meeting. Now, with that, I will go ahead and uh, have uh, visitor comments. So, if we have any visitors that care to make a public comment. Um, I'll, Please uh, ra raise your hand, and uh, I think Laura will recognize you. Do we have any visitor comments at this point in time? You'll also have an opportunity at the end of our meeting as well. 
Okay, I do not see any comments, Tom. So we will go ahead okay. and I... go on to the meeting attendance. Let me just do a, a quick uh, roll call. Uh, we've got Caroline, Stephanie, Heather, Tom, Cannon, and Stephen. Did I get, is there anybody that I missed? Okay. Okay. Well, uh, since we don't have quorum, then, then the uh, next item, uh, approval of minutes, that's an action item and we can't take action without uh, a quorum. So um, I guess I'll move on to committee business and uh, that's a discussion item. So, um, John, is this where uh, you you wanted to share like uh, the some of the timeline that we have for LCAP? So I'll, I'll go ahead and give you the floor on that. Great, thanks, Tom. Yeah, I can provide a little bit of background about where we are in, in the um, LCAP process. So I, I think it's important to share that the main components of the LCAP. Um, there, there are the goals, there are the metrics, we have the actions, the expenditures, and then there's the stakeholder in, engagement piece. So before COVID, um, we were able to complete uh, our goals, our metrics, and then begin drafting actions based off of the stakeholder input that the LCAP PAC and other stakeholder groups provided last year. As you know, we're currently engaging stakeholder groups again focusing on the three questions that we've been asking all groups and that we're gonna re-engage with again uh, later on in, in our meeting tonight. And then using that information, uh, district leadership has been reviewing or will review, reflect and refine those actions that were established last year um, based on what we're learning uh, this year since COVID happened. Um, and then what we'll do is uh, in, in April, for example, we will be sharing with the LCAP pack the themes that have emerged from the various stakeholder groups, um, as well as review the considerations uh, that the LCAP PAC made last year to see if anything needs to be added, uh, removed or, or, or revised. And so um, after this meeting, uh, Tom, Heather and, and I will be sitting down and, and figuring out a, a way to engage with those two documents, I guess simultaneously to help inform the considerations that uh, the PAC will recommend. Oh, Tom, I think you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, as, as we've mentioned before, and as was, uh, I think, uh, shared previously, and I, I put it into chat is a timeline that uh, I think that it was a timeline that uh, has been presented to the LCAP pack in, in the past. So uh, if you click on that, that, that will open up some of the timeline. Um, and I think maybe, um, we, maybe that's something that at every meeting we can kind of uh, show the timeline and where we where we are uh, in in the process. So, and I think it's is there anything else on committee business we currently have? Is there any anything that uh, anybody cares to um, on the committee cares to bring up now or any questions? Okay, I guess hearing none, we we can go ahead and move on to the next agenda item of the San Juan Youth Voice Advocate. Great. All right, Tom. I this is the I, I get I love that I get to introduce uh, this group. So I think as we all know that in order for us to improve as a district, we really need to hear from those that are directly impacted by our work, and and, and that is our students. Um, so I know you're going to be really impressed tonight when you see and hear how our students are not only leading their own learning through this process, but they're really leading our learning as well. Um, so, you know, I've had an opportunity to visit some of these listening sessions, and I, I think what you'll notice is that to do this work, it takes a lot of confidence, it takes a lot of humility, it takes a lot of care. And I think you're going to see those leadership qualities come through in this next presentation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christina Sparks, who's doing an amazing job uh, leading this work with our students. So Christina, I'm going to turn it over to you here to uh, introduce our students here, our student leaders. Great. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Christina Sparks, 
and I coordinate the Learning Communities for School Success Program grant in our district. And as part of that district, one of the or part of that grant, one of our activities is to develop the San Juan Youth Voice Advocates to help elevate youth voice in our district. And along those lines, you will not be hearing much from me tonight because we have four amazing youth voice advocates here. Um, one you know, Kenan, who's part of, of the PAC. And then we also have Ashlyn, Dylan, and Hezekiah. And Kenan is going to get us started. Thank you so much, Ms. Sparks. And once again, thank you, Elka, for having us tonight. I want to start off by introducing myself to some of those that I haven't met yet. My name is Kenan. I'm a member of the LCAP PAC. I've been a member for two years now, and I'm also a member of the San Juan Youth Voice Advocates. So the San Juan Youth Voice Advocates, uh, Ms. Sparks, if you want to switch the screen really quickly. Let's see. There we go. Okay, perfect. Uh, so the goal of the San Juan Youth Voice Advocates is to bring forth student voice in the district through listening sessions, which we can then put forward in the LCAP to further our movements and the things we do in the district and the improvements we share. So the students on the Youth Voice Advocates team are actually a diverse group from different schools and the different groups within those schools. So as you can see, we have 15 students from diff seven different schools, including two non-traditional schools and one non-public school. And this is all within our district. Um, and then and then if you want to switch to that one more time, there we go, perfect. And then uh, we, so we, San Juan Youth Force Advocates started in 2019 through a partnership with Innovation Bridge. And since then, we have been hosting listening sessions every around spring, beginning of the year. And this year, we actually moved to online listening sessions where we host them over Zoom to accommodate for the pandemic and the distance learning. And I'd like to pass it off to Ashlyn to, to explain the different steps we take in the process of our listening sessions. Thank you, Kenan. Um, hello, my name is Ashlyn. Um, so First, uh, we had each San Juan Union School District youth leader, um, as well as our adult allies from targeted school sites, facilitate or kind of get engaged in a five-part training series. So we first started by engaging in our own listening sessions. Um, we did this in about November of 2020. Um, and then our second part was empowering, where we actually learned how to facilitate the meetings and kind of different tips and tricks to kind of get the waters warm for the students while we were preparing. Um, and our third part, which was acting, uh, we got to facilitate our own meetings. I had the opportunity to facilitate three wonderful meetings. Um, and then our fourth part, which was advocating, we learned how to organize and to kind of collect all the data that we had uh, received from the students and to share it out into reports. And our fifth part and our final part, which was activating, uh, we learned strategies to promote collective action informed by uh, session findings. So what are listening sessions? So listening sessions are opportunities to truly listen to individual and collective experiences and perspectives. Um, they create safe space and place for thoughts of reflections to be captured through a series of questions. And it's also a learning opportunity around strengths or assets, areas of needs, challenges, and exploration of strategies for improvement. Um, so also, uh, storytelling, which is a process of self-discovery and reflection, highlights the power of language and forming thoughts or actions. Um, we also had customized listening sessions using guided prompts to meaningfully gather thoughts and suggestions, and it help, helps embrace and promote community. So our listening session protocol, we kind of had it written out for us and we kind of just changed it so that way it helped um, work along with our students. So we started with welcome and introductions where each leader would introduce themselves and we would have the students introduce themselves as well in the chat or out loud. And we then went into our group agreements. Um, we had already set some out, but we asked the students if they had any, they could also add those in. And we went in with our community icebreaker, which our favorite one so far is what do you mean? Um, and then we went into our listening session overview, kind of explaining what they would be doing and how it would be helping us. Um, so our first part, which was telling your story, we gave the students about three to four minutes to kind of gather their thoughts collectively and write it out on a Padlet link responding to each individual question. And then telling our story, we came together as a group collectively and we had them verbally share out or shout in the chat and we would kind of read it out for them if they wanted it to be private. And our last like little closing parts, we had them share out one board of how they were feeling after. And then we explained to them what we would do, what we would be doing with the information. And we also welcomed them for coming out of their time because most of these sessions were after school. And sometimes it's really hard to transfer from Zoom calls. Um, so our listening sessions took place between February and March. Go ahead and move on. 
Thank you. Um, so we had about 95 students at 10 different high schools. As you can see, there was a lot of diversity, which helped create a lot of different answers um, from our students. So here we have our prompt. So our first prompt, which was something I love, we have the students describe something you love about your distance learning experience, something that's helped you learn or made you feel connected, safe, and supported while distance learning. And we asked them to be as specific as possible and include why. So one of our significant statements was something I love about distance learning is the ability to manage my own time. Um, I now have my own schedule I go by, which is looking pretty well. Um, and our key themes we had were flexibility, convenience, and working at their own pace. Teachers have been helpful, available, and working hard. We had community building and lunch zooms and more available time. Now for our second prompt, we had, if I ruled the world. Um, so we asked them, you rule the world and are in charge. What is the one thing that you would make sure each student experiences or receives to ensure they are prepared to achieve their future goals and be as specific as possible and why? So one of our significant statements was, I would ensure that my school is a safe space for the LGBTQ community and BIPOC, having a zero tolerance policy for any type of harassment and discrimination. Um, some of our key themes, again, were access to tools and resources needed to be successful in life, such as finances, time management, college applications, career exploration, et cetera. Um, they also, another key theme was safety and trust, um, everyone feeling more comfortable throughout this and school supplies and necessities for everyone. Turn it over to Kenan. Thank you, Ashlyn. So the third prompt we actually asked our stakeholders was a problem I see. So this is where we gauge the problem that distance learning brings with it to, to the students in our district. So overall, we found the mental health, mental health challenges, lack of support, inactive, unmotivated students, and uh, lack of connection to peers, as well as unmotivated staff, all add into the different problems that distance learning brings with it. A key quote that we actually pulled from our, dis, uh, from our listening sessions is, students aren't fully engaged, whether being that they are asleep, not listening, or just not engaged, or learning with the lack of, of a bond students have. The fourth prompt we shared with our stakeholders was how I want to move my community, where we prompted a solution to the problems that students see. So we kind of pulled from the different things we've heard that students want to see more health, mental health supports, more outreach from staff to the students and district interaction, as well as they want to address diversity issues and social awareness. An important quote we found from our listening sessions was just to just be easier on the students. It's been difficult for everyone. And then the fifth and final prompt we asked our students to share is um, what students want to see through the district summer activities. So many students said that they wanted to see more credit recovery and more understanding of material previously learned. So um, they also wanted to see more real world skills, internship, job, community services offered in the summer program. They wanted community building, peer interactions, as well as safety should be considered when we do the summer activities. A very important quote we found from our listening sessions for summer activities is that, um, and I quote, I would want each student to have the opportunity to meet with their teacher to discuss problems that they have with a course. I would want to foster an environment where students don't feel ashamed of not knowing concepts they should have been taught. Overarching themes in our, over, overarching themes in our uh, um, listening sessions overall is that many people want mental health support. They want outreach from staff to students, opportunities for social connection, access to tools, resources, and supplies to be more successful in the classroom and outside of the classroom. I'd like to pass it off to Dylan and Hazea Kai, who will share their findings from their targeted listening sessions. Thank you, Kenan, for introducing us. Hello, my name is Dylan, and this is Hezekiah. Me and Hezi are all the... Oh, Dylan, um, we can't hear you. Try again. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay, sorry about that, guys. No well, problem. Uh, Low internet connection. Hello. Uh, thank you, Keenan, for introducing us. My name is Dylan. This is Hezekiah. Although we are part of the San Juan Youth and Voice Advocates, we're also part of the Chosen Ones. Chosen Ones is a leadership opportunity for foster youth to make a voice for other foster youth. Hello. Thank you, Dylan. My name is Hezekiah. I will be talking about our process that we had throughout the listening session that we had to go co facilitate. We had a very active group. They were very, very participating with us. Even though we had a small group, it felt like we had a big group the way they was engaging with us. 
as you can see, this is a, we have seven students at three different high schools throughout El Sereno, La Vista, and non-public school. And this is like the El Cal groups represented. Dylan. All right, so the first prompt is something that I love, which uh, someone had to describe uh, something that you love about distance learning experience. But one of the main uh, thing we saw in the significant statements is distance learning teaches us how to be independent. One of the main keys is work in progress and more comfortable and flexible. The second prompt is if I rule the world, and which is one thing you will want to make sure each student experiences to ensure they are prepared to achieve their future goals. One of the main keys we saw is that we want everyone to have the knowledge to pursue jobs. Um, another problem is a problem I see. They have to like say a problem they saw during distance learning and a significant statement is aching fingers due to the load of work our teachers give every day thinking we're smart enough to do all this work. And one of the key themes we chose was COVID and health and wellness. Another prompt was how I want to move my community. It's like during distance learning or when we transition back to regular school. And it's another significant statement we chose was having the right skills to focus and equip the skill to work on work done, get school work done. And the key, th key themes is examining graduation requirements due to special circumstances related to COVID-19 and provide financial and physical resources for student success. The last prompt was hello summer. And so this one was if you wanted to create a summer program, either distance or in person, what is one thing that you would want to each student to experience that will support their learning? One of the main uh, key significant statements that we found was that every student should receive a Chromebook and have a teacher that will meet their needs. The main key themes that we found here was uh, meeting interests and needs, physical and engaging activities, team building, and uh, more peer interaction. Um, now, I want to say thank you guys for letting us part, um, talk to you guys about our experiences throughout this program. And I would like to pass it to Keenan to explain some more we did. Thank you. So another targeted group we actually did listening sessions with were the Latinx groups in the district. So here we learned that these students and stakeholders like the flexible schedule that comes with distance learning. However, they want to see more skills taught to them that they could be useful in the future. Some stakeholders are struggling with mental health and the amount of schoolwork that comes along with distance learning. And they also want more engaging classes, connection to peers, and expansion of their social skills now that they're stuck at home in distance learning. Our final targeted group was the Black Student Unions across our school district. These were from three different high schools, Bella Vista, Encinita, and Rio Americano. We learned that these students want to see more support and resources for their mental health, physical health, and academics. Uh, they want more understanding of their different struggles that they have through distance learning, as well as they want the district to address racial inequalities and more opportunities for their voice to be shared. We just want to say a quick thank you to district staff, uh, school program and staff supporters, as well as community partners and San Juan Youth Voice Advocates for being able to participate in this listening session. Um, we will now open it up for questions. I got a question. First, let me just say thanks to all of you. I, so impressive, um, so articulate. Keenan, at one point you mentioned materials and supplies, more access to materials and supplies. And I think there were some other things that if, if we could get more specifics about what that means, um, and maybe you can share that right now, that'd be great. And Ashlyn, I just want to tell you, Cabinet just set aside an additional $10,000 this week for the support and expansion of our BSUs in the district at both middle and high school. So, uh, you know, right. thank you for bringing that up as well. So Ken, if, if, you, if you have specifics on that, that'd be amazing. Yeah, of course. So I don't currently have specifics as our district-wide report is still being finalized. We should have the district-wide report finalized within the next week or so. Ms. Sparks, I don't know if you have any more information to add from the district-wide report. All right, so some specifics were things like technology, just making sure that um, the Part of it was making sure that the support that have been given will continue such as technology, Chromebooks, um, things like that for distance learning, but 
things like basics, like paper, pens, pencils, school supplies, um, and then resources as we've been, I know as a district providing some resources for community supports like to food and um, technology or low cost um, other resources. And so just making sure those things continue um, into the summer and beyond. I think people are concerned that once distance learning goes away or things kind of change with the pandemic that these things won't be available. Um, and then as Kenan said, we there will be a district-wide report that provides more um, details and information. Question. I was uh, um, wondering if, if this group may, might be looking at, um, there, there's additional funding that is becoming uh, available to school districts to address the, the learning loss that has uh, occurred over the pandemic to try to facilitate uh, um, learning recovery. Is that something that uh, this, this group may be looking at and discussing and coming up with suggestions? Yeah, so that's you, wanna, you have any? Oh, go ahead. That's one of the topics we discussed in the um, summer and kind of down the road prompt we asked. That was our fifth prompt. So we do have, we have a lot of insight from our students on different things that they want to see coming in for credit recovery and whatnot, especially during summer and heading out into next year, next school year. So uh, definitely when we have that finalized report completed for district wide, uh, we'll have more key themes and different points of how to move forward with that information. Okay. All right. All right. Tom, you ready or can I ask a question? Now? No, go ahead. Go ahead, Bonita. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. Actually, I have a comment and two questions. First, you guys are amazing. You did a wonderful job. I'm curious, <clears throat> were there any surprises you had when you were talking to your peers, when you were asking them questions? Do you have an aha kind of moment? And also, how can we support you as a district to continue your leadership? Um, I can kind of cover that one. Um, so again, I had the chance to facilitate three different meetings um, and it was spread across three different schools. So we kind of had a little few moments um, where we saw a lot of kids feeling the same way about distance learning. But um, one of the big ones that we've seen so far, which was kind of like, you know, like a mm moment uh, was driver's ed. A lot of students have kind of felt the need that they wanna see that program um, start up again. Um, and they explained a little more about how they, you know, are losing a lot of the things that they would like to go forth in life. Um, and some of these programs that we've taken out uh, isn't really doing good for them. So I would say driver's ed was kind of the aha moment of uh, the biggest thing that they're losing. Thank you, Ashlyn. Would anybody else like to say anything? Uh, I could say like, on my listening session, I. Our, our kind of ha ha moment was like when kids was upset about staying at home and distance learning and stuff like they're so like amped up of going back to school but we couldn't because like a, a lot of COVID stuff and the spikes and all that so I'll say that like that's our ha ha moment for me and Dylan's English session. Thank you. Would anybody want to share how we can support you as you continue to grow as leaders in the district as youth voice we don't want it to stop after this. I definitely think programs like this, like the San Juan Youth Voice Advocates, definitely helps further the voice of the youth within the school district, as well as you know different students who come and participate in the listening sessions. So definitely think programs like this, definitely we should keep inside the district and keep them going. Thank you. Heather, I see you have a, oh, I see you have a comment. Would you like to come off mute and ask your question or make a comment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, thank you all so much for your leadership and for all of your hard work. Um, it really shows and it's really impactful to hear firsthand what your your experience is. Um, one of the things that I had a question about was um, you all had mentioned like mental health and what it got me thinking about was the fact that, you know, at LCAP, we talk a lot about like mental health services and, and different things being available to students. Um, so one of my questions is, uh, did you get a sense when you were talking with your fellow students about whether or not students were aware of those services that are available through San Juan currently to support? Um, and I, I guess it's kind of a two part. And 
And if so, are there barriers that you all um, as students may be experiencing to, to, ac um, to accessing them, excuse me? Yeah, I feel as if uh, when we were doing our presentation to our peers that uh, they knew about it, they just didn't know really how to reach out to them or uh, get access to them. I feel like that is the uh, barrier that we are facing at the current moment. Um, and just to add on to what Dylan said, um, a lot of the students that I had talked with um, said that they weren't really um, seeing a lot of ways that they could. Um, and a lot of teachers haven't shared out that information, especially during COVID and being at home, a lot of kids want more access to be able to talk to adults. Um, so again, exactly what Dylan said, um, they're not exactly sure how to access that or who to go through to get that information. Wow, that's, that's really important. Thank you for that. Do you all feel like, um, like there might be an opportunity, like would, would tech like an app or some sort of um, like remote way to access that be helpful to you, do you think? Like if I there was like a San Juan app or something that you could download that can give you access? I feel like if that did happen, I feel like uh, they would have uh, better access to it. And I feel like they would have more motivation to go and do it, especially if it's like anonymous. Yeah, like it's like a, not really has any uh, hooks to it. They will just get there and able to talk to anyone. Hmm. Well, um, and to add on uh, real quick, um, I think it would be super cool if by chance, um, kind of how you guys have an anonymous chat uh, between, you know, real mental health uh, crisis lines and stuff like that, if one way we could kind of go through the school to create that for students so they kind of know that they can talk to someone in the school district um, would be a super good support system for a lot of the students. That's amazing. Thank you all so much. Do we have any other questions or comments for the San Juan Youth Voice Advocates? I'd like to just jump in here really quick here, uh, Laura, and I, I just want to let you all know, you've already heard me say this, that working with all of you since starting my new role here in this position has been a highlight uh, for me. And I just want to call out the way you facilitate these listening sessions, it's not an easy task. What you do takes a lot of skill, it takes a lot of preparation. And so I just want to recognize that, that that definitely is not going unnoticed. The amount of hard work and care that you're putting into this process to facilitate in the way that you do that creates that safe space to share the way that folks are sharing is really remarkable. So I just wanna recognize it, keep up that hard work. It really is paying off and, and uh, you're, you're just doing a wonderful job on that front. And then just as on a personal note, um, I just wanna thank you for, for inviting me in, into your space, virtual space for these mm -hmm. sessions these last few times and just letting me be a part of it and, and learn from you. And I just want you to know that I'm really excited to be learning with you uh, as we move forward um, in my new role here. So thank you all so much, just really thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to say thank you again to Kenan, Ashlyn, Dylan, and Hezekiah for their great job presenting and the time they put in to prepare and all the great work that they've done along with their other uh, fellow Youth Voice Advocates. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Great. Thank you, Christine. Appreciate you joining us tonight. Yes. Well, this, this is Laura. I don't know if any of the students are watching the chat box, but uh, people are also putting just really uh, great comments in there about what a wonderful job all of you students have done tonight. Very impressive. Uh, they're just uh, thankful for your work in the district. And so we just wanna share those comments with you as well. And one final comment I wanted to um, bring awareness that our community partner from Innovation Bridge, Bell Reyes is also here on the, in the meeting today to support these students. And um, they provide all the training and collaborative work with, with me and the students to make this just a, an amazing program. So just wanted to um, highlight Ms. Bell Reyes as well on Innovation Bridge and Britt Irby. I'm not, I'm not sure if she's on tonight, but she is um, also part of Innovation Bridge. Thank you, Christina. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is uh, we're gonna just transition into our next activity for, for this evening. And it's gonna be around um, uh, looking at our, our, our jam boards from the last time that we, we, we met. So 
when we met last time, we were able to reflect on some questions that focused on student learning, uh, feeling connected to school, and a summer, uh, a summer program as well. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, these are questions that we have been using with stakeholder groups uh, across our district uh, that included our students, our staff, and our families. Um, and since so much has happened because of the pandemic, that in order for us to create that meaningful district-wide plan for improvement, um, as I, again, as I said before, uh, we need to um, really hear and understand the experiences of our diverse committee. And so, uh, since our purpose here is to bring our individual voices into one collective voice, um, our purpose now is to build on the discussion that we engaged in last time to identify some overarching themes that will then inform our next steps in improvement work as we plan for the 2021-22 uh, school year and beyond. Um, so you will notice here in a minute, we're gonna do what's called a gallery walk here. And what we've done is we've taken all the ideas from the Jamboard pages that we discussed at our first meeting, or our last meeting, I should say, and organized them by question. Um, so what you're gonna do now is you're gonna be assigned to a breakout group to identify themes on the three Jamboard pages. Uh, each of the groups is gonna have a facilitator. And then every five minutes, your group will have a uh, an opportunity to transition to a new Jamboard page to identify and build on uh, the identified themes from that question. And then after each group has contributed to all the, the Jamboards, we will um, uh, return and, and do a little share up from what we, from what we noticed here. So uh, Laura is going to have us break out into the rooms. Uh, you'll be in, again, breaks out into the rooms and then every five minutes we'll do a shift of room so you'll be able to see all the different pages and all the different questions. All right, welcome back everyone. Thank you so much for, for, for helping us out on, on that. And so as um, we kind of wrap up this activity, I just want to just give a minute here. Does anyone want to share out what they noticed or anything that was a surprise or that they would like to share with the larger group? I'll share something. Sure. Um, I think in our group, we really noticed across all three jam boards, yeah. just the theme of just the impact that this past year has had on kids. And just really um, the theme that emerges just around how much catching up there is going to be to do on the socio emotional side. And that, you know, how realistic is it for teachers? or students to really um, engage in other areas of learning when that is the one thing that's been basically missing this whole time. Mm -hmm. And it'd be nice to have a way to address that. Thank you, Caroline. Okay, I just wanna second and echo Caroline, that's it's going to be, yeah, that's the toughest part. Well, I just want to let you all know that the reason why we, we've been engaging in these activities, and I mentioned it before, is that the themes that you were able to identify tonight across these different questions, along with the themes from the other stakeholder groups that we've been engaging with, we're going to be sharing that information um, with, with district leadership, and that's really going to help inform um, and, and uh, like I said already has helped inform and will continue to inform as we make these revisions to our LCAP actions and as we look ahead so I just want to thank you so much for 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 your thoughtfulness on on this process here because this is really going to help us out collectively to create a plan that's meaningful um, not only for our, for our students but also that uh, hopefully that we as a community can see ourselves in the plan moving forward so thank you so much for that um, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to turn it over here to my, my, my colleague here, Tom, who's going to take us to our next activity here. So, Tom, go ahead. Oh, Tom, I think you're on mute again. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, so, as, uh, as the LCAP is uh, developed, um, then our, um, the, the LCAP um, consists of basically, a, it's a, a form, a blank form that uh, the state of California requires that we, that, uh, you know, be filled out and there's all sorts of areas in it. Um, and so our activities are to take our, the way that we connect 
um, to the school sites, what our personal experiences are, uh, what has inspired us to be part of LCAP and to make that sort of connection to something that applies to a, the planning process for the entire district. Um, and and to, not only to the entire district, but hopefully it would be things that would be uh, applied for as part of a three year plan. Um, and the, uh, the plan is reviewed annually with re revisions. But uh, so that's, that's kind of the best way to connect the dots of how we connect to the LCAP from our personal inspiration. And then using that tying into things in the LCAP that are measured, the, the metrics. Um, last year, we engaged in activities that uh, built the strategic framework with the four focus areas. And those four focus areas were um, approved by the school board. And um, so John, can you kind of comment on the uh, four focus areas? Uh, I believe, you know, those are most, those are mapping to the LCAP goals. And I'm pretty sure that the, that's the, the four focus areas that the LCAP worked on last year will be the goals. I'm not sure if, if there's any, if, uh, if, if there's any changes, whether it have to go to the school board, because we want to make sure that our strategic framework and the LCAP goals are aligned. Um, so the overall LCAP goals are sort of the overarching concepts. Um, let's see, do, do, let's see do, we, do we have a slide of what those uh, four focus areas are? Um, um, I do not have a clean slide of those. Okay. Um, well, okay, so the LCAP, uh, as I mentioned, is a blank form from the state. One of the top level ones that's, that uh, we fill in are those goals. So those goals we've already sort of filled in. We'll be moving into other parts of the LCAP where you fill in what um, actions and services and the metrics to, to measure those. those tie in to the dashboard in the indicators of, of how the goals that we set um, and are, are measured and where, where progress is being made on those goals. So uh, as we think about our personal connection, being able to think of what has inspired us and how what has inspired us to be part of LCAP connects to something that is measurable um, that uh, that is we want to capture that and um, move uh, use that as a way to move forward in our in the work that of developing the LCAP so um, we came up with a form uh, which was actually sent out an email and Laura have we had people fill that in already are there I any think results just I think one person has completed it so far. Okay. So should we go ahead and uh, since we, it looks like we have time, do we wanna go ahead and have people um, put that link to it you bet. In, in the chat now and have people uh, click on that Google form and fill it up because I, as I recall, there's just those three simple questions and so that allows us to capture um, our committee members' connections to LCAP. And then from there, we can uh, be building in our subsequent meetings because in our, John, do you wanna talk about in our subsequent meetings when we will be getting more into the details of uh, the actions and services and how those are being, the action services and, and metrics that are uh, being, developed now? Sure. So um, as I mentioned before, as we are finishing up collecting the stakeholder engagement work that we've been doing that we did tonight and that we've been hearing from our student voice advocates is just as an example. Uh, when we meet in April, um, we will be sharing the overarching themes from all the stakeholder groups 
for the PAC to be able to look at that and, and consider in being able to support the recommendations or the considerations, I should say, that the PAC will make for the actions. Um, as I mentioned before as well, that the actions, many of them have already been drafted based off of the information that was provided last year prior to COVID. But again, a lot has happened since COVID. And so to just move forward without any reflection on the last year, um, you know, we, we, we believe that's important, which is why we're spending so much time engaging our community to make sure that we've got it right, um, or at least as best as we can have it right. Uh, so the timeline will be April. Uh, you will be able to look at those overarching themes from across the groups and have an opportunity to then um, also review the past um, considerations that you made and make any revisions as you see fit. And then at the same time too, while we're collecting this information, we are reflecting and revising those actions as well to better reflect the, the needs that we, and from what we're hearing from our, from our stakeholder groups. And then in May, we'll be prepared to share that draft plan with the LCAP PAC. And, and because, um, because the uh, four focus areas are the overarching, it, it's probably good to go ahead and review those. So I'll go ahead and read them. I, I put in a link in, in the chat. Yeah, Tom, Tom, yep. I can't, let me stop sharing. I can pull up the strategic framework doc that has the four focus areas. Would that help? Yeah, because I, I think that that is something that uh, as a strategic um, framework for the entire district, then these everything we do should be underneath this overarching umbrella of these four focus areas. And so they are good if, if whatever your personal connection is, if you can kind of draw uh, the connect the dots between how you connect with one or more of these four focus areas, then it helps the helps keep us all working in a common ground area and common understanding. And it also helps us take our experience from being, you know, this is my personal experience that happened to me. This is what I personally uh, observed or, or heard about. And it brings it into the overarching framework of we are doing something for we, the collective we of the entire district of all our students, families, staff, community. Um, so it, I, I think in a lot of ways, uh, our strategic framework in these uh, four focus areas kind of need to be emphasized uh, more frequently, more often. In some ways, I kind of view them as, you know, these are as important to the strategic uh, mission of our school district in the same way the Bill of Rights or in a similar way that the Bill of Rights is fundamental to our system of, of government. So um, just like people can recite what the first and second amendments are, I, I think it's uh, for people to work on the LCAP and what the mission is of our district, it's important for them to recognize these four focus areas. Um, and uh, uh, perhaps as an exercise, I'll, I'll go ahead and read the first one and maybe John can read the second one and maybe Heather can read the third one just to emphasize these. So connected school communities, uh, caring staff actively build community relationships, identify assets and needs and connect students and families with resources to help them access and best uh, access the best opportunities our schools have to offer. And I'll, I'll just mention that as we were going through the exercise with the Jamboard, I think you can see that some of the things that you see in these focus areas are themes that were coming out in the Jamboard. So, um, is it, uh, John, do you mind reading the second one? <laughs> I don't mind at all. So yeah, healthy environments for social emotional growth that all staff will cultivate inclusive, safe, equitable, culturally responsive and healthy environments by integrating social and emotional learning to ensure essential student development. Okay, and let's see, is there somebody that wants to volunteer for reading the, the third one? I got you, Tom. So number three, engaging academic programs. 
All educators engage and support each student in a challenging and broad course of study that builds skills, knowledge, and experience, preparing all to be critical thinkers who communicate effectively, collaborate, and are civic-minded. Okay. And is there somebody that would uh, care to volunteer to read the, the fourth one? I'll read it. Clear pathways to bright futures. Our whole school community engages each student in discovering their limitless potential and through coordinated efforts prepares them for college, career, and bright futures filled with opportunity. Okay. So hopefully everything that you saw uh, and that we've worked on in the jam boards and the themes, you can uh, find that they connect with at least one of these four focus areas, which will be uh, our LCAP goals. Um, yeah, Tom, you know, I'll just add here because I can see some questions coming up in the chat. So, oh, um, yeah. you know, we have an overarching mission. And so it's the idea is that we have a strategic framework and everything is connected. So there is alignment. So I'll just say that, right, for example, um, that we have our mission and that mission is, is uh, if we want to achieve that mission, then we need to live out our values. And so we have values such as inclusivity, real world knowledge, voice, social, emotional intelligence and perseverance. And then what we do is that we've then applied an equity lens using a theory for continuous improvement that helps us target our focus areas, which we just uh, reviewed. Um, and those focus areas become our overarching goals um, that, that we use to design our LCAP, but also what schools will use to help uh, develop their school SIPSAs. So each of the actions that we are identifying will be informed, will be di directly connected to the focus areas and will be informed by quantitative data that we, we have, not only that the state requires us to, to, to provide, but also local data. And then a big part of our work too is about lifting the voices of our stakeholders in our community. So using all of that information, that's how we identify actions that um, we believe will help us reach our goal, um, our goal focus areas. There's also a question in the chat back, chat chat box from Caroline. I'm wondering if there is a staff member on that may like to provide some input. Uh, the question is, do we have any actions tied to reforming middle and high school instruction? When I looked at the data this weekend, it tells an urgent story for Black, Latinx, and students with disabilities. As they age into middle school and high school, the percentage of these groups that are at grade level drops dramatically. And that is also reflected in graduation rates, which also have lifelong impacts. So, so again, the question is, do we have any actions tied to reforming middle and high school instruction? I'll do my best to answer this, this part. So reforming is, I'm not quite sure about the reforming part, but I will say that we do have, all of our actions will be connected to supporting student learning, both at the elementary, middle and high school levels. And when you're looking at this data, I think um, uh, we are looking at the data through, we are disaggregating data and looking at it from different perspectives and lenses, just as we are engaging stakeholder groups not just one stakeholder group, but a variety of different stakeholder groups. So collectively, when we have our state and local data, we disaggregate it, which means that we look at it from different perspectives, um, uh, you know, by different student groups. And then we're able to combine all that information to figure out actions that we believe will help um, reach our goals. And, and John, I, I appreciate that because I, I was struggling with the reforming middle school instruction as well. That's that's very broad. So I. Um, can offer a little bit more comment on that. I mean, I think it's just what really, really striking when you look at the data for for a foster youth as well. You know, it drops off. I mean, overall, our percentages are not that great in math and in English. Uh, but when we look then at how those groups fare over over that. Uh, you know, experience into middle school. It's like, you know, middle school, there's a step down and then in high school, there's a cliff. So to me, that tells us 
what we are doing in our big box schools isn't necessarily what these, the way that these kids need to be taught. So what is it that we can do to approach that from a different perspective so that it doesn't become just about having an aligned mission and goal, uh, but that it becomes something that the student really feels that support and accesses that support. And that we see that be, you know, um, in the outcomes that over time, we start to see those figures go up. I, I guess, uh, you know, in, in addition, I'll, I'll mention that uh, um, the California Department of Education, they, they identify student groups within a school district that are significantly underperforming. And uh, one of the groups that Carolyn mentioned is students with disabilities. So um, is there information that we have of how uh, we are specifically addressing the um, th those student groups that have been identified for differentiated assistance, and um, in our in our previous LCAP, were there actions and services, and can we kind of talk about um, how we are addressing the students that are in those categories that are calling for differentiated assistance? So the LCAP does ask us to. Uh, articulate how each action is supporting um, specific student groups. So when the draft of the LCAP plan is, is shared with, with the group, um, it'll be public and be able to see how each of these action items are completely or connected to serving and supporting, um, increasing or improving services, I should say, for our own duplicated student groups. Okay. I have a, a quick question as it pertains to um, the SIPSA and, and kind of like closing the circle at the LCAP level to see if the school level plans have been allocated in a way that reflect the recommendations at the higher level LCAP, if that makes sense. Because um, having been at school site council and working at the school site um, SIPSA plan, um, what I, I noticed a huge difference. So I, I started at school site council and then I came to LCAP and I realized that the SIPSA, at least at the school site that I was working at, was not specific as it pertained to um, addressing our unduplicated student groups um, in the way that I understand them to be now. But I also understand that there's no real correlation between our LCAP recommendations and how those funds are actually allocated at the school site level, if that makes sense. And so um, hopefully that does make sense. Do you have any context for how, like what those checks and balances are or, or how we close that circle to really analyze that? at this table or do we like where is that reviewed so if i if i can respond to that and yeah um so our school sipsas are aligned to the lcap goals and each sipsa has to identify the target of populations for which those funds and services are targeted for the okay. loop back is it it goes through the to the board of education so our, our school sites work on these plans together. They then are um, presented to the Board of Education for approval. So that's the, that's the connective tissue. That's the, that's the body that approves it beyond school site council. Okay. So when, our, when, when the SIPSs are approved, um, is there any sort of checks and, and balance that's sort of done as to how well aligned the SIPSA is with the LCAP? Is that, so is that done by, by the, the school board? They are reviewed internally by staff and then staff presents them to the Board of Education for approval. So it, it is, there is a checks and balance system within the district organization to review those. Okay, all right, thank you. Can, and are there instances where um, a school site may not be focused on kind of the highest need students? And if so, what kind of, what's the feedback loop to the cases? 
So the funds that are um, identified in the SIPSA, that it, that's what's presented, is are through the LCFF supplemental funds, as well as they'll ident identify their Title I funds. They can only go towards targeted groups. And I am coming on that. Yes, yeah, go ahead, Stephanie. Okay, um, I'm not gonna hide anything, basically. So everybody already know my husband has been having um, mental health issues and everything else. And so we're, we're kind of dealing with that. So it got so extreme that my children got taken with CPS in the last week and a half. So they're at a friend that she's autistic certified and like a daycare. So she grabbed them and took them right away. So they're staying there. So my main focus is their academics and their attendance. So as I see that everything that we're talking about is like I'm experiencing because um, of reaching out on that main focus, keeping the kids academics and their attendance up. It's been hard because it's like it dropped so quickly, like fell down when it was so high with a high GP, um, GPA rewards and attendance awards. Now it's like that motivation is not there. As I'm reached out to the school with um, staff, I'm still trying to engage and get that connection so that wouldn't fail. So if I'm going through this, who knows who else is going through this? And how, and matter of fact, me taking the initial steps of all the multiple steps, I know some parents don't, don't even have those resources like that. So I'm just trying to think as, as a, another parent that, that doesn't have all the resources that I have, they're stuck in limbo. And I think that's where our, um, our metrics is low and we're trying to reach out how to, to engage with those, with those families, as well as get engaged with those students to try to be motivated to log in, knowing they have a change of lifestyle at the moment. So I just want to throw that out there. This is just for y'all to figure some things out. So yeah. Thank you, Stephanie, for sharing your story and being vulnerable with us. You're welcome. Um, yeah, so I, I, I appreciate your share, Miss Stephanie, um, sending you love. And I think that you're speaking truth, right? Our, our families are struggling right now in lots of different ways. And um, and we really need to figure out how we can balance the social emotional support and, and, you know, be responsive to the varying needs of all of our different families right now. Um, yeah, that's, that's big. Thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. Yeah. Cause I don't think people really take in perspective that children, um, they have that bond, especially after school activities, um, when it gets taken away and they're, they're in it, it's like, they're innocent. And so it's like they're they're doing everything they're supposed to be doing as a, a parent. But when another parent's having a mental health crisis, that affects the whole family as well as to the school because the school staff has been like, "Where are they at? I miss them. I love them and everything else." And so that bond right there, that's that engagement bond with the child and the school. I'm so appreciative that I have that and I've seen that. Um, but there's still that disconnect. Yeah, that's the one link chain is just still missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think this this is a good example of where the personal experiences we want to connect those because uh, as an LCAP committee and putting together a plan, we want to have a plan where we can say these are the experiences, and we're looking at the plan and we're seeing an action or a service and something that's measured there that goes, oh, good. I see that there is going to be something in the plan that is going to address the needs that I, that I see. So um, that, uh, yeah, Steve, I see you got your hand raised. I'll go ahead and give the floor to you. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I just wanted to share something personal as well. It's like, um, as a parent, uh, you know, trying to keep up with all the assignments and make sure everything's turned in. I feel like a failure sometimes because I own my child's uh, future and I own, you know, and, but 
when I have, uh, you know, all these assignments and my kids crying and, uh, and I don't want to do it and I don't like school anymore. And, and then I feel like a failure. And then I get down on myself because then the, the Google classroom email goes out and these assignments are done. And then I feel like a failure and it's really nothing I can do because I'm doing the best I can trying to balance my kids happiness and school. And so there's, there's so many different things that are coming at parents and I'm handling it. Okay. It's, you know, I don't want any sympathy from anyone for that, but I'm just sharing my experience on what it's like to receive all that. It's brutal. It's not, it's not positive for the parents. So we're taking the brunt, we're taking the brunt, we're taking the brunt. And then you get this end of the week thing where, Oh, by the way, what you already knew, these uh, aren't assigned. And it's, it's kind of an attack. It, it, it's just a personal experience for me on the data that's sent out every week. Hey, Steve, the- remember when I, when I said um, blend the academics with activities? Um, that actually, uh, it relieved a lot of stress. So when you, <laughs> so it was like, I take, I'll look at their homework overnight while they're sleeping and I'll take some stuff and then they'll be playing like an afternoon or whatever, if they didn't go to practice with the kids outside like water balloons or some hula hoops or whatever. And I kind of blend that together. And then like, it kind of adapts where they remember it and it makes it easier for me as well as stress. So it's kind of like, you got to figure your own creative game out with the academics and and it'll it'll relieve a lot. And then they'll start getting it. Yeah. And and I know I do a lot on the side that doesn't get put in to the learning category. I, I, just the everyday conversations I have with my kids, they're learning from me more than anything right now. And I don't get any credit for that. It's just part of being a dad, but it doesn't go into the, ma- the metrics and the matrix of the data that gets analyzed too. So there's, there's some omission in data that we're looking at that's not being quantitated, quanti- qualified or on any level, unless someone opens their heart like, Stephanie did and you know I'm trying to do is give some uh you know it's no one's ever gone through this before it's totally brand new and um we should tread lightly on that you know and and make good decisions early that's the best thing you can do it's easier said than done but that's what we have to do and Steve I just want to as we kind of you know bring this together here I think you just highlighted the, the point that which is why we're engaging our communities as much as we are, why we're trying to interact with our students, why we're trying to do the listening sessions, why we're trying to our best to engage our communities, because you're absolutely right. There's the experience that's behind the data that we are trying to understand. And so um, to Caroline's point, as we begin to try to develop these actions, it's, it's gotta go beyond the numbers on, on, a, on, a, on the California dashboard. And so do I say, do we have it perfect yet? No, but as I, I believe we've made a lot of growth in terms of our ability to engage stakeholders. And I just, I think I've said in the PAC's commitment to really continuing to lift the voices of our community so we can understand those experiences behind the data that's there. Because Steve, that's what you're saying is absolutely right. Like that's what can't be captured. And that's what we need to hear from. So I just wanna thank all of you for, for, for being vulnerable as, as, as Melissa said and sharing those. And I hope that as we continue to engage in these conversations with one another, these are the things that we hope emerge as we start to try to better understand your experiences um, and your and, and your children's experiences as well. So we can be we can start to improve. So thank you for all of that. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, John, so is, is it the, this? It's is it the staff here that is basically hearing this very raw stakeholder input from our uh, community ad, ad, advisory committee? Are they the ones that are then taking this and then translating that into what will become written statements in the LCAP that will be actions and services and uh, developing how they're going to write actions and services and metrics that are going to sort of address this, the, the needs that they're hearing in this raw community input? It's a larger group effort in that time. So it's not just the folks in, in this room, but again, I would, I would say that it's the, the, the reason why we are collecting this, the raw data as you say, is that technically it's the community that's writing the LCAP, right? And, and so we have the responsibility of um, lifting the voice of the community, as I've said a bunch of times to try to make sure that's reflected in our, in our LCAP. So 
I'm, I'm being very purposeful in my language here that yes, we might be the folks that are collecting that information and capturing that voice and creating the narrative of that journey for, for the community. But ultimately it's the community, all of us that are creating the LCAP and that um, our goal is for our community members to see themselves in the LCAP. Okay, all right. Um, so thank you, thank you for the answer. Helps. Very welcome. So tell yeah, me if you know, I think, oh, oh, yeah, go ahead. With, with Sorry. even hearing, with even hearing, and Steve, I appreciate, and I appreciate everybody sharing that. When we have a district of forty thousand students, um, we need to hear from as many folks as we can. And I think Steve really, you know, uh, in my conversations with students, and in you know even my last SPAC meeting, they're not concerned right now about standardized testing and the results of that. Um, they're concerned about building relationships, encouraging the love of learning again, as we have students coming back to school. And there is very few data sets that are going to give us that. So as John said, the dashboard doesn't measure so many things. It doesn't measure anything that Steve alluded to or Stephanie spoke to. You know, we, we look at standardized testing and we wanna say so much about that, but when you're in a classroom and you have a group of whether it's first graders or whatever grade it is, and they come to school on the day they're supposed to take that test, if they just had trauma occur in their life, that test is meaningless. And yet we say, here's an indicator that happened on one day, and we're going to say we're successful or not based on that. High school kids in 11th grade are supposed to take a test that's meaningless to them. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't mean anything to getting into college. Um, we push to get a 10th grade test, but we, we've gotten nowhere with that. High school kids will fill in the bubbles. They, they, they tell me that because what's the benefit to them to taking these assessments? We need to get down to, that's where I think community engagement and John, as you speak, uh, not to offend any, I so appreciate the people that are here, but if we were to say there's five or six people that are speaking for 40,000, if you weren't one of those five or six, you'd be so offended. So we need to have as expansive of engagement. Um, we continue to expand student voice. Hearing these kids today was the highlight since the last time I met with my student group. And so more and more of these, we have so many amazing kids doing amazing things in our district. Um, we need to allow more kids to speak to the adults. Um, and, and so I just, I appreciate this group today and, and just appreciate the candor that folks are sharing. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I really want us to, to be, you know, as open as we can to all folks, all students. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of people complaining about models at board meetings or this. And I've got to tell you, it, it kind of feels like it's one sector of our, of our district and our community. And it's a very affluent group that's coming from certain schools and we really haven't heard the voice. And, and there's a lot of people that say to me and acknowledge that who aren't staff. And so again, we need to reach as broadly as we can to hear the voices of our students and our staff. Can, can I tell you, um, <laughs> as you say that <laughs> about um, how other parents and everything else have their the other opinion. Um, I wish I could report Nora's face at times <laughs> because she's like, what are they talking about? Do you guys want your kids to be sick? And it's just like, man. She, and then when she does certain um, assignments, she's like, what is this going to do for me? And then everything I teach her, like um, taxes on like a receipt when you purchase things. Um, she's like, this is what we need to be taught in school. Like life, what she say? Um, Mom, you always teach us financial economics. I'm like, yeah the life skills. And she said, that's what we need. Just blend that in and that will help us more. So I just want to throw that out there that since she's not here, that's one of her opinions she has been saying lately on connecting Thanks, uh, the school. I really appreciate this entire conversation and <laughs> it's, um, it's giving me, it's giving me life. And I just want to acknowledge the fact that, um, you know, you all sharing is just, it's everything because it's the human part of why we're here. 
um, and and the difference between systems and process and the human experience is sometimes so vast. Uh, at the end of the day, like this is the why, and um, we do have to be flexible in this season. And Ken, I almost fell out of my seat when you were talking about the overrepresentation of of the affluent folks, you know, as it pertains to occupying those spaces where their voices are. Um, overheard and other folks maybe not so much and you know I'm I'm a parent I I had COVID in December around Christmas and I had to isolate from my kids in our own house and you know they had to go to school and do all these things and it was really hard for us and our family um you know and and we have a lot of like financial insulation and stuff that other students that maybe maybe don't have and you know, it's heavy and it's unprecedented. And so um, I appreciate that you all are taking so much time to listen, to engage in different stakeholder convenings, and even taking this time now, um, because it feels very inhuman to be so focused on a process that doesn't fit the time anymore. Um, and, and it's almost a little torturous at times to just talk um, about you know data process systems and and old things <laughs> that don't exist in today um, without acknowledging our very real experiences and being able to say it's really hard and that's okay. So that's all I got. Thank you, Heather. I did, oh, I, I did want to say that um, uh, we you know, when we look at at the LCAP and we talk about indicators one nice thing that I did find about the way the LCAP process is designed is that even though the state has their state indicators, there's local indicators, and the LCAP process itself allows school districts to develop their own indicators. So if there is something that they see a need to address, that they look at the state indicators, they, they look at you know recommendations from the state, they go, you know, these indicators don't really measure what we think we want to measure inside our school district. Our LCAP can develop its own indicators in those, you know, um, and, and put them into the LCAP. And so I, I wanted to bring that up. So if there are other things that when we look at the indicators, we go, there's, an, there's not an indicator there that I see uh, addresses something that I think needs to be addressed and something that we can then say we need to address it and this is how we can quantify where we are now and where we want to go. We, the LCAP allows you to develop your own indicator and write it into the plan. So I, I just wanted to bring that up and let people be aware of that. Great, thank you, Tom. I appreciate our discussion tonight. And so as we think about closing this evening, um, we're gonna ask you for one last uh, favor here, um, is we, we would like to do a little bit of a debrief. And so we wanna hear from you about your experiences uh, this evening. Um, because ultimately we wanna make sure that we can make some adjustments and improve our meeting spaces here. Uh, you'll notice we've created a, there, there are three questions that we've created that focus on um, what worked well, what we can do more of to improve, and if there's anything you would like uh, overarching just to share with us that you would like us to hear. So we're going to place a link in the chat for you to access our, our feedback form. Um, and then you can either answer the questions now if you would like, because we are, it is about, uh, a, a, you know, 8.15. So if this is built in time for you, you, you can answer these questions now. However, if you need some time to process and think, we're going to leave this link open um, until the end of the day uh, tomorrow. Um, but again, I just want to thank all of you again for, for coming and learning from one another this evening and also just creating a space where we can share and connect with one another. Because ultimately our goal is to not only learn with and from each other, but also to be able to connect with one another on a personal level so we can feel that greater sense of belonging as a community. So thank you. Thank you all. And and, and Laura, if you could just put that link in the in the chat for, for yes, folks. Yes, it's there. Excellent. And then um, I think. I just want to say that we appreciate you and, and just to wish you all a wonderful night. So, Tom, do we just have to do it a, an adjournment here? Um, or did Laura? we? I see Paula turned on her camera. I wanted to see if there was anything that uh, you, you wanted to say as our board liaison and, and president of the school board. 
Oh, uh, thanks, Tom. No, I've been here the whole time. I don't, it's funny. Now, I was reflecting on why I had my camera off. And sometimes if I'm not looking directly at the camera, I will actually get emails saying you look bored and you're not paying attention when really I'm looking at all the boxes. And so now I turn my camera off, which is also not exactly engaging. And so either way, I just wanted to say um, I have been here. I've been listening. I also just can't engage with the chat because the way I have my iPad set up, it's just not the easiest. Um, but I just want to say thank you for the reflections, for, for the stories. Um, I don't think any of us <laughs> think this has been a walk in the park for anyone. And I think just, you know, and I'll speak just from my perspective, but I didn't, I didn't ask for four more years of this job to do it remotely. Like this is not how we serve our kids and we know that. And so um, I'm getting pretty excited about um, getting folks back into in-person and we're gonna, there's gonna be a lot of conversation and there already is about learning loss and what all that means, et cetera. And like, these kids are amazing. They just survived a global pandemic. Like, frankly, I'm not going to stress that much about the learning loss. I want to make sure that they have healthy connections to um, their families, to their peers, to their community. And that means so much more to me. I'm not going to sit here and say academics aren't important, but I'm just going to say that particularly as we look at what recovery looks like for me, um, it's not, it's not going to be strict numbers. It's, it's going to be, how do we make sure that our children feel fulfilled. Um, and I don't know how to do that. We're gonna have to figure it all out together because I've never survived a global pandemic. Um, but I mostly wanted to say, I, I literally cannot imagine what it's like to raise kids in a pandemic. So I admire you all so much. Thank you um, for, for just trying to keep the, the rails on the tracks. And um, I'm really looking forward to the next stage. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, the, the words. And I guess uh, we, um, Laura put in the link in the chat. So uh, hopefully, if you haven't filled out the form, uh, you can take the next, you know, 10 minutes because uh, officially we, our, our meeting will go to 830. But I think we can go ahead and adjourn now, unless anybody has anything else they, they want to say. Um, and uh, thank you, Laura, put, putting it in the chat. So, um, so I, uh, Tom, sorry to interrupt. We did skip over the visitor comment and I, know, and I see oh, that Neelam, yeah. Neelam's out there and she would like to make a comment. Go ahead, yeah. Neelam. It's especially thankful to PAC and LCAP to be the part of, and I learn more about the system, about the thing. So it's really nice to be here as previously, I'm there also a teacher and a primary in charge. I love to be the part of meeting and I learn much more. And I want to uh, support the people who are new here and grow their children and make them better on the future. That much, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Neela. Yeah, thank you very much for, for, your, uh, for your comments and uh... Um, I, I uh, suspect that uh, we, we may have some openings in the LCAP that I, I believe you may have already put in your application. So, uh, so anyway, I, I guess unless there's anything else, I will, uh, I guess, formally adjourn the meeting. So uh, going once, going twice. And, all right. Thank you. Good job. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody.